in a beautiful chilly night of November. <laughs> You're laughing, of course. <laughs> In 2017, we welcome you here, uh, three of our most important leaders in the district. To my right hand side is Laura, and then Amy, mm -hmm. and Susie. Hi. Uh, we have had you, you and uh, Laura, for a long, long time, but this mm -hmm. is the first time we are honored to have Amy with us. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yep. That's right. Uh, Laura Daly is the director of learning supports in the Iowa City Community School District. Mm -hmm. What a big title. <laughs> and doing a lot of things, right? Yes, we do have a lot of student services in our department. Yeah. Wonderful. And the, and the, and the Amy Kali is mm -hmm. the youth and family support mm -hmm. uh, or specialist. Right, I'm a uh, student and family advocate. Advocate. Yep, at City High School. At City High School. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, probably our audience are familiar with Susie <laughs> Bolton. Been here a while. Been <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as the head of the health service, or the director of the health service in our school district, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, how would you like this show uh, to go? You would start first giving sure. us a little background of you what bet. you do. You bet. Uh, some of our audience here know you as as uh, principal mm -hmm. of Wickham, right? Yeah. And they miss you there. Yes, I miss I miss our wizards too. Yeah. Do you miss <laughs> classroom being now the director and all? You have this. Uh, luxurious office in the oh, central. So yeah. luxurious, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little cube. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. That's right, that's right. Yes, yeah. I, I do miss um, that everyday interaction with the students and the staff. Um, and uh, I think I just see it now that all of those years of experience that I was either teaching or, you know, being a principal, which was which was a long haul. Um, I've been in education for a while, but now I can use those experiences to try to think about just district level supports and services and how to um, you know, make th that accessibility for students and families and staff uh, for the various learning supports that we have a little bit smoother. And um, you know, just thinking about our multi-tiered system of supports. What do all students need in a quality educational um, environment? And what are some additional things that some students need? And, and maybe some intensive supports that just maybe, you know, a few of our students need to make sure that they have. So you, found, you, you have found a new interest. Uh, I mean, you moved from the trenches to the <laughs> kitchen, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So. Uh, I, I definitely, I mean, the, the old memories of being in classroom and uh, interacting with kids and mm -hmm. teachers uh, have its uh, very special uh, flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, now you are in the planning uh, center, yeah. in the brain of the education. Sure. Y you still have the interest to uh, do that too. Yeah. You like it. I do like it. I have found that moving in every phase of education, every educational position that I've been in, you um, are so focused on, on providing the services for the students or the families or whatever that level of that type of position is. And so every time I've had a different sort of position, meaning like teacher, principal, and now as director, it just gives you an additional perspective of the system as a whole. And I think that now as a director and thinking about um, what my uh, life was like as a principal, for example, then what can I do as a director to try to support the principals who are supporting the staff, who are supporting the students, and we're all supporting the families in the community. So it just gives you a deeper perspective, I think, and I've learned a lot in the last, a little bit over a year that I've been in this role as director of learning supports. You know, sometimes we think we know what other parts of the educational system are like, but until you live it, you probably don't. So I've, it's been a huge learning curve for me. I'm very much liking it, but going back to your first question, I do miss a little bit of that kid and student and family and staff contact that I was used to Definitely. all day, every day. 
Amy, Amy has the luxury of yes. having this all the time. That's right. <laughs> all day, right. every day. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh, now tell us what kind of supports mm -hmm. you have. Yeah, so um, in our Iowa City Schools Learning Supports Department, we actually have a slide that we could show okay. that gives a little bit of an overview. There's a lot of different um, areas in it. Um, one of them is our health services uh, that Susie will talk to us about a little bit later. Um, and I mean, just the things that Susie oversees for health services is pretty wide and pretty deep. So that's just one area. And then we also have um, a plethora of other areas. Our English language learner program is in there. We have um, our assessment system uh, to determine if students qualify for English language learning services, our mental health supports, um, student and family advocates such as um, the position that Amy is in. Uh, we even have career and uh, development process for the individual career and academic planning, um, our school counseling services, K-12, um, our BASPs and our 21st century learning program, so that's the extended day learning. Uh, we have our youth and family development um, program in that. Um, let's see, what am I possibly forgetting? We yeah, have just about homeless, everything. The homeless, the homeless which is part, part of what Joan does for yeah, the youth and family development. Mm -hmm. And um, so that all is, it's very encompassing. Um, and those, um, kind of a good way to summarize it as our social emotional behavioral supports, but it's even a little bit more than that too. Um, so uh, you just mentioned now the homeless, mm -hmm. and uh, um, I have learned that Amy, mm -hmm. uh, why don't you tell us this before they get the slides now? Sure. Uh, t tell us about your trip to Chicago and uh, your presentation in, in the national conference. Right. There. So one of the things that um, our district does really well is identifying and verifying and serving our homeless students and in the community and because of that we were able to go present to the National Associa Association for the Education of Homeless Children and Youth and so we got to talk about what our district does and how we filter from the district level down to the individual student level how we how we serve um, and support homeless students in the district. And what, what, what did you learn that's new to you after you came from this conference? One of the things I learned is that not all districts Similar. have have yeah. a have a procedure to oh. identify homeless students, and we were there at one point too. We kind of learned about homeless students' happenstance, and then we served them as as best we can. Now we're more much more proactive in going out and looking for and asking direct questions of our families so that we know what what services our students need and how we can support them in the district. I have to tell you, Amy, that uh, um, in the public in general mm -hmm. it doesn't feel the enormity or the the extent mm -hmm. of this problem. Yeah, can, just to can, can you just give us more light? Uh, definitely, uh, definitely. Just the 2016-2017 school year, we identified 514 students that were. Um, either temporary or transitionally housed. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're on the street. They might be doubled up because they lost their housing. They might be sheltered in one of our many shelters in the city. So that's a, that's a large number for our district. It's Good. gone up every single year. It continues to go up. And um, so what we do as part of the services that we offer them is we offer them transportation to their school of origin. So st homeless students and families are typically very transient. So they might move from Coralville to Iowa City to Cedar Rapids to Solon trying to find permanent housing and when they do that they typically have to change schools and we know that there's a lot of educational deficits that can happen when students have to change schools in the middle of the year so one of the things that we do is provide transportation to school of origin so if a student starts the year at City High and loses their housing they can continue at City High throughout the year so they don't have to start over at a new year we also uh, provide free lunch tutoring, shoe and clothing vouchers, and then we partner with community agencies so that we can help them find health care. We partner with the children, the, with the clinic so that we can get them immunized, immunized and, and get their health where it needs to be so that they can be, so that they can function at, at a level at school. Yeah, I, have, I have to uh, ask a question now yeah. uh, because this is a lot of information as mm -hmm. a matter of fact and, and to 
offer this service, n you need a lot of uh, money to, right? Mm -hmm. How do you get your money from? That's a great question. I think I'm going to throw that one to mm -hmm. Laura. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have uh, certain funding that we receive each year from uh, the state, and um, we have to uh, have line item budgets about how that money is um, allocated and spent. Some of it um, goes toward tutoring, some of it goes towards transportation, all the services that um, Amy just mentioned. And, um, and we have to be um, very diligent and, you know, follow the, the budget and, um, you know, submit it just like any other uh, budget process. And uh, one of our, um, our homeless liaison for the district is Joan Vandenberg. And uh, she's um, the one that primarily oversees um, that budget and works with many of the, you know the student and family advocates as well as others at the ESC to um, provide those quality services for our students who've been identified as uh, qualifying. And, and the grants are available. Mm -hmm. There are grants that um, certainly, when you take a look at uh, students who. Um, we want to ensure that they have equitable access to educational services. There are a variety of grants that um, we would we could tap into and that we do tap into for um, students that um, have homeless status as well as um, free and reduced lunch or you know sometimes there's a, a combination of qualifying factors that might um, lead us to submitting a grant but absolutely we look for any additional uh, type of supports and funding that we can because there typically is not enough in um, education to do everything that we want to do but uh, we always ensure that the intent of the you know money is allocated to the supports that have been used to qualify for certain students and families. So if, if, if one of our audience who are watching us mm -hmm. right this moment mm -hmm. uh, listens to this mm -hmm. and, and a lot I'm uh, honestly, Amy, not mm -hmm. many people know about mm -hmm. it at all. And then they say, okay, I am uh, donating so and so to bring uh, uh, a singer to Hancher. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I should use the money, yes, bring a singer, but use the same money to pay mm. for the. Uh, how do you, ac do you accept that? I mean, if. If somebody wants to donate something, do you accept it? It has to go through the foundation, mm -hmm. and then yeah, mm -hmm. it would so different programs. Right. Yeah. So the foundation would be a great mm -hmm. place, and then we at at City Heights, people will drop off coats, they'll drop off clothes, and then we can hand them out to I our students. I am not really advertising. Need. I'm not mm -hmm. planning to <laughs> use this yes. uh, forum right. in right. order to uh, raise funds mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah. but I, I mean, I'm I'm so shocked. Yeah. 500 kids homeless right. mm -hmm. in, a, in a city that is luxurious. Right. Mm -hmm. We uh, often say we they're hidden in plain sight. So they're yeah. in our schools, they're in our classrooms every day. And we day have and money here uh, flooding mm -hmm. everywhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, making beautiful buildings mm -hmm. everywhere, uh, mansions everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, a little bit to the pot mm -hmm. will not hurt much, right? Right, right. right. We just had a, a parent donate a whole bunch of graduation gowns to our yeah. students who, who are homeless that can't afford a graduation gown. So, yeah, if people are interested, they can call. Let alone the proms and all right. of that. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important that we, we use our community partners because United, for Action, United Action for Youth has, they, they have a lot of clothes and prom dresses. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to prom and homecoming, then we partner with them so that any student that we have that financially can't go to prom, then we can partner with our community agencies to get them what they need. Uh, that's great. Um, uh, so uh, now let us move to the other service. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, we, uh, let us go to Susie because uh, we didn't hear from you yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been overseeing health services for a long time and um, we have a commitment, we have an obligation to make sure that children's health needs are met during the school day. So that's kind of first and foremost. So we have traditional health services in that sense through our school nurses. We have eight school nurses now. So we continue to add positions as the, as the district grows. Um, and our school nurses are, are very um, involved with, with students and families 
where the child has some chronic health condition and to make sure that we have plans in place that we're meeting their needs during the school day. So children with severe asthma, type 1 or type 2 diabetes, um, seizure disorder, things like that that have some of the needs that need to be met during the school day, then the nurses are very involved in that, in working with that student, their parents, and the other school staff, and their health care provider as well. Um, and then we uh, have a lot of state requirements <laughs> as far as health goes. So making sure that all children are immunized according to our state laws, that some grades need to have vision screening, some need to have a dental screening. So we have a lot of things that are being required by our state that the nurses work on and ensure that, that our students are meeting those criteria. And we often bring in we work with community partners to ensure that these needs are being met. So we've got some great collaborations with the Johnson County Public Health. They're coming and doing screening, it's like dental screenings and putting sequence on children's teeth, all kinds of things like that that are going on. And then also we have athletic trainers in our district that work at our three traditional high schools and provide services to our student athletes and ensuring that they are uh, healthy and if they're and preventing injury a lot of work on the concussion piece, um, making sure that we have some foundation in place, the children, that the athletes know how to prevent concussion and they're wearing the right gear and that sort of thing. And then if they do suffer a concussion, then we have a program in place to make sure that they don't get, go back to playing the sport too quickly and are at risk for re-injury. So that's, those things are taking in place. Wonderful. So I, I think it's about time now that we watch the video. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. If we can go now and, and see that, and and then if we have any comments later, uh, Laura, sure. now you have that. You bet, you bet. So this is just a good visual that um, describes what I had mentioned a few minutes ago about learning supports being just that wide range of um, services or programs or strategies that really enhance the learning environment for um, students and. When we talk about a healthy, what we say in the state of Iowa, MTSS system, a multi-tiered of supports, that green kind of represents what all students, be quality core instruction and social emotional supports for all students. The yellow represents that some students may need some supports that are in addition. And then the red is that there's typically, you know, a few students um, that then need even more intensive supports. And so this is just a good way to depict that, you know, it may be support for instruction, it could be, we've mentioned some community partnerships, it could be making sure that there's a safe or healthy caring learning environment. It's not just about academics, for example, you know, how different ways and programs to engage youth um, and their families, supports for different transitions throughout the school um, time. And, you know, it's all about uh, engaging families in that educational process as well. So this is just a good overview if people are like, what, a, what are learning supports? You know, what's, right. what's kind of, what's right. it all about? And so this just helps describe sort of um, in, in big picture what it is. And then the next slide shows um, all of the various different parts that are in our learning supports department. And so as you just kind of go down that list, you can see that um, each of our and will sub areas have um, someone who oversees that, a coordinator who oversees that. Some people share a few different titles. And um, so it really, our learning supports department encompasses a great deal of the um, overall quality educational experience that students receive, um, going from anything to the before and after school experiences to um, how students are planning their individual career and academic plan, their post-secondary plan, for example, and um, any, you know, the intake process for our English learners to determine if they qualify for instructional English language services. And Amy's highlighted our mm -hmm. homeless supports, of course. That's just one piece of what student and family advocates do, and um, we'll probably share a little bit more of that. But this is just, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of, um, leadership in a lot of important areas that are um, provided to students through the Learning Supports Department. Excellent. Susie 
kind of maybe she probably explained a few of these, but these next few slides are a little more specific to her area. Yeah, so like I said, I mean, healthy students are optimal learners, so it's really just really crucial that kids have their basic needs met, their health needs met, before they're going to be ready to learn, to be engaged in the classroom. So we work on that. And that was what I was describing was our, right. our traditional health services. So we can go to the next one mm -hmm. because yep. we have already discussed that. Yes. And these are just some additional things that we have in place. We're very fortunate. We have a school-based health clinic that is a collaboration with the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics and um, College of Dentistry and other partners that we provide medical care on site to uninsured yes. and underinsured, including the homeless. So they're able to get that free, free medical care. Um, and that's going on for 10 years. Um, and then we also have psychiatric services available through the clinic. And then we have mental health counseling services available in all of our schools with community partners. And then this is just a slide that shows student and family advocates um, are not only the liaisons for our homeless students, but we wear a lot of other hats in the, in the district. So that's just kind of an overview of what right. we do. And again, these are the services. So the homeless students are served under a federal law called the McKinney-Vento Act, and that was in place in 1987. And these are some of the things that that federal law requires the school district to do. So um, it's just a list of those. And then I think one important thing that we do is that every single building in the district follows the same protocol for identifying and verifying homeless students. And I think that that's where, that's why we were asked to present at the national conference because it's a model that not very many people use. So this is just kind of our steps that we go through. And then I think because we do that, we have some pretty impressive numbers. 95% of students who um, were identified through McKinney-Vento get to stay at their school of origin. So that's, that's an amazing number. Iowa City has a great, um, a very, very low dropout rate. It's less than 1%. And nationwide, the school dropout rate is about 8%, depending on the data that you look at. So we have a great, a great baseline. Homeless students nationwide drop out at a rate of 60%, but we, the Iowa City School District, we're at a 30% dropout rate for homeless. So we still have some work to do, but based on um, the national statistics, I think that this process that we have in place really supports our students and helps them manage th all the way through graduation. Yeah, and then that's just our little plug of <laughs> when we presented this Remind Remind people of your name, too. Yeah, right? exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. And so there was a team of mm -hmm. um, individuals, so two of Amy's um, colleagues, Becca, um, who's at Coralville Central, and um, Shannon at Alexander also presented, and Joan Vandenberg, who is our homeless liaison, and the um, Youth and Family Development Coordinator was there as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I was able to go along. I can say that there was standing room only. They literally <laughs> had to turn people away from the session and um, they really did a great job. They had a lot of great questions, um, districts or schools who were just really looking to get those systematic uh, processes and procedures mm -hmm. in place. So well done by our student and family advocates and it certainly represents the work that all of our student and family right. advocates do. Um, but we, we, we know how much work it takes to develop a presentation and to really be leaders in the field that way. So we commend the work of um, all of our student and family advocates and kudos to Amy and her Thank team you. for their presenting at the national conference. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I have a couple of minutes, but I, uh, the, the medical man in me, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, you know, it, uh. it, it, it pokes me. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, I want to ask you about the, uh, you know that nationally now we uh, are talking about the opioid uh, yes. epidemics. Yes. And uh, IV drugs and all that. Uh, can you shed some light about this problem in our community? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the school, but in general. Yeah, it's, it's a problem here. It's, um, we're not immune to it. So we're seeing, and not necessarily in the school, people are pretty good at hiding their opioid addiction. So it's really hard to know. 
but um, there have been some deaths in our community related to opioid, opioid overdose. And I know our medical community is well aware and really looking at their, their, uh, how they're prescribing opioids um, and how they're recommending that people use pain medications. Um, we know that our kids have access to it just in their family medicine cabinet. So it's definitely an issue. We're trying to educate our kids through our health education curriculum um, and through then student family advocates, school nurses, really working with kids and their families if there are any addiction concerns, addiction problems, and making sure that they're getting the help that they need. And then in, and we're seeing more mental health issues in general. So it, it, all, it all goes together. But yeah, we are not immune. It well, is here. I can't thank you enough uh, for this wonderful, uh, delightful uh, episode of Education Exchange. I guess I, uh, I have to wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't want, but <laughs> I guess I should. <laughs> thank you very and much. And then yes. thank you for, uh, for being our host, uh, uh, for being our guests. You are the host too, because <laughs> you're more familiar with this place than many people. And in the meantime, I, w I would like you to come back and maybe uh, at the end of the year, tell us where uh, the, all the new advances, all the progress that you will achieve, okay. update us. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Amy. Thank, thank you. you, Susie. Welcome. And thank I you. wish you will uh, have a wonderful evening in Iowa City. Thank you. And to our audience, you can see us on channel 18, channel 21, or one of those 800 expensive channels if you are <laughs> well off. <laughs> and the media come is merciful <laughs> with you. So anyway, if you, if you fail to get us on any of the TV channels, you can always turn to YouTube and we'll be there tonight. So you can get more information about how your kids are supported. Thanks to Public Access TV for all the service that we receive. Thanks to John Kerhoff, the father of this program, together with his brother, really brother, Michael <laughs> Peterson, who started this program 27 years ago. Good night from Iowa City.